You know, our, our passage this morning, and, and you may have seen it in some of the lyrics, but our passage this morning talks about inheritance. And I thought, what would be a good idea is to maybe look up what are the biggest inheritances that people have gotten, uh, at least recently. Uh, number three on the list is Mark Madishitz from the uh, Red Bull Fortune. $37 billion. Oh, yes. Children's Church. How is the time for Children's Church? Who will release you? Mrs. Linscombe has stuff ready for you. Mark Madishitz from the Red Bull Fortune was left $37 billion uh, by his father in, uh, in 2016. He's uh, since uh, uh, raised that up to $39 billion. Uh, number two on the list is Francoise Betancourt Myers, who in 2017 received a third of the L'Oreal fortune when her mother passed away, and she received $51 billion in her inheritance. Now, since that time, just a, a few years, about seven years, last year her total worth was amassed over $100 billion, becoming the first woman to be a centibillionaire. Uh, it has since fallen down from a couple mistakes here or there or something. But number one on the list is Julie Koch, the Koch Brothers with Koch Industries. She uh, was given $61.7 billion when her husband David passed away a couple of years ago. Now, I want you to think about just for a moment, what would you do with an inheritance like that? Let's just give a nice round number. Maybe it'll be easier for you. How about $50 billion? What would you do with $50 billion? Why don't you take just a moment and tell the person around you one thing that you would do with a $50 billion inheritance? Go ahead. Well, my guess is that there's some of you maybe who are thinking, I would take that trip that I've always wanted to take, maybe to that nice island out in the Caribbean or in the, in the South Pacific, and then I would buy the island. <laughs> or maybe some of you are thinking about a car that you've had your eye on for years, right, the 1966 Mustang convertible fully restored. Maybe you think I would I would buy a really nice house. Maybe some of you are your answer was I would finally get out of debt. That would be a huge gift. But an inheritance that big means making a lot of choices, doesn't it? But what if I told you this morning that there's an inheritance greater than any of these people got? And it is available and secured for every single person who puts their faith and trust in Christ. That's what our passage this morning is going to help unveil to us so that we can better see how God has provided for us. So, I would invite you to turn in your copy of the scriptures to Ephesians chapter 1 and keep it open there this morning as we're going to be looking at this passage. We've been looking at verses 3 to 14 the last couple of times we've been together. And we said that this, this passage, verses 3 to 14, is all one sentence in the original Greek. And as we've looked at this, it describes the blessings that we have in Christ. We have received Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Paul says. We have been presented as holy and blameless before him as a chosen people. We have been adopted to God himself as his children. We have been redeemed to God through Jesus' blood. And we have been forgiven of our sins. We're part of God's plan to unite all things together in Christ. 
That's what we've seen so far, and we're going to conclude this long sentence by looking at verses 11 to 14 today. So I invite you to follow along with me as I read. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord, and every word of God proves true. So this morning, with God's help, I hope that we're going to see from these verses, and from the ones previous to it, the believers in Jesus should stand confident in their future. Believers in Jesus should stand confident in their future. As we open the text this morning, I invite you to pray with me and asking God's help in that. Lord, you have blessed us by communicating to us through the writing of Paul and through your Spirit's teaching that we are unique when we put ourselves into Christ's hands. We submit ourselves to him. We become part of your family. We are endowed with many blessings. And would you help us to see that in a world that seems uncertain, in a future that seems shaky and rocky, that we can have confidence in our future in Christ. Would you teach us by your spirit so that we live in a way that reflects that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in this passage we have seen that God's will and his work are for his glory. We have seen that throughout this passage, and I'm going to start this morning at the end of all these things so that our hearts and our minds are rightly focused, and what I mean by the end is not starting in the end of verse 14, although that's part of what I'm going to start, but the end goal, what is the result that God desires in giving us all of these spiritual blessings? Paul's already talked a lot about it in these verses about the purpose for which he has done, what he has done for us in Christ. For example, in verses 4 or 5, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. And then down in verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his, there it is again, his purpose which he set forth in Christ as the plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So we see there's a purpose, and we see that purpose leads to the praise of God's glory. So then in our verses 11 and 14, we see it again. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And then again, down in verse 13, 14, you receive the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So God's plan to bless us with spiritual blessings has a purpose, and that purpose is to bring praise to his glory. All these spiritual blessings are purposeful and intentional. Now these gifts are tremendously helpful to us, right? We are given everything that we need in Christ. We are united to God through Christ. We are in right standing with him as we are made holy and blameless, as we are uh, forgiven of our sins, even though we don't deserve it. These spiritual blessings bring us into the family of God. We are redeemed, we're bought with a price and adopted as God's children. And they entitle us, as we have just read, to the inheritance, which is ours in Christ. And so our future is secured through what Christ has done. But I think a lot of times we look at this list of spiritual blessings and we go, oh, that's mine, oh, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine, and we get caught up in the blessing. And we should be eternally grateful for them. We should live each day in light of them and be reminded of them regularly. But I think too often we can get consumed with the blessings as though they are all about us. 
And sometimes we can look at those blessings and we can say, wow, I am so special. God blessed me with this because I'm special. Because I'm so good. God wanted me to be part of this family. Like he was lacking in something. But Paul is saying the purpose by which these gifts are given, the end result of those purposes is not our pleasure, is not our fulfillment, although that brings us pleasure and fulfillment. But the end result is the praise of God's glory and his grace. What is God's glory? The purpose is to praise God's glory. What is God's glory? John Piper defines God's glory as the beauty of God's many perfections. When God does something, it is glorious and deserving of praise. When God chose a people before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, he did something glorious. When he declared sinful rebels to be holy and blameless, he did something glorious. When he made his enemies, his children, he did something glorious and gracious. When he paid the price for our redemption through Christ's blood, when he forgives sins and removes them from our accounts, he does something glorious and gracious. When he unites people from all creation into one family, he's doing something glorious. When he grants us eyes to see and ears to hear and believe in Jesus, he does something glorious. When he secures our future for us. When he predestined our inheritance from before the foundation of the world and he keeps it for us, he is doing something glorious. And we see all members of the Godhead involved here. In verses 3 to 6, we see the Father choosing a people, predestining us to inheritance, excuse me, to adoption. In verses 7 to 12, we see the Son at work, his blood bringing us redemption, the forgiveness of sins, and obtaining for us the inheritance. And then in verses 13 and 14, we see the Spirit at work. As we hear the word, as we believe, he is placed in our lives as a seal of possession and as a guarantee for that inheritance. And yet we kind of go along our day going, well, I don't know. I'm not really sure if God likes me. How can we keep from just singing his praise all the time? How can we keep our mouths shut when we pass every ear and not tell and speak of the glory of God, of what he has done, just the things listed in these few verses? We have a reason to praise. And the purpose of God's doing this and including us in it and blessing us with these spiritual blessings is to bring praise and delight to his glory. <laughs> C.S. Lewis says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It is not out of obligation that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed or until Greg tells them to. Yeah, Greg, you were reading my notes because, you know, in my notes, I have the next thing is just to talk about my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie and I love each other. And we don't mind sharing that joy with each other. We tell each other. If you go to our house, you'll see pictures of moments that we spent together that we wanted to capture in that moment so that we could remember the joy of that moment. In our room, we have post-it notes and notes around our room that we've written to each other to express the joy of our love for each other. We send each other texts throughout the day. I love you. I love you more. I adore you. I just can't stop thinking about you. It's not, it's not an obligation. I don't have an obligation to do that to my wife. I love her. I, I find joy in her. I, I love to do acts of kindness that she does for me. I praise her to herself. You're amazing. I praise her to other people. My joy is not complete if I just hold it inside and go, oh, I really like my wife. But I don't tell her. I don't tell you. Joy, my joy is complete in that, in that I share that. 
And joy is an overflow, and it results in, in a way, praise of my life. It's not the way that we are to praise God. It's a small bit. But praise is the goal of these blessings. Do you praise God for your blessings? Do you think about them? Do you return to them? Do you burst out in song, usually when nobody's around? <laughs> How do you respond to God's blessing? Paul reminds the Ephesians that all of these blessings are to result in praise and honor of God. As we go through our day, walking in these many, many blessings, our hearts and our minds should be thankful, filled with great joy, and full of praise to the God for, to God for who he is and for what he's done. God's will and his work are to the praise of his glory. And so what Paul is telling the Ephesians is to focus on the gospel of Jesus to the glory of God. And this gospel addresses our past, our present, and our future. The gospel addresses our past and our present and our future. Now that we know the end result, the purpose of God's plan, and the goal of praising his glory, let's go back and look again and get another angle at what Jesus has done for us to secure this goal. You see, in verse 13, Paul writes, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The gospel, when you hear, when you heard the gospel, and you believed in it, you received the Holy Spirit, you came into union with Christ. Now the gospel of Jesus, as I said, addresses our past, present, and future. The gospel addresses our past. Very quick tool for sharing the gospel or remembering the gospel are these ten words. The ten words, the gospel in ten words. God loves, we sin, Jesus died, God forgives, we accept. I just want to walk through those quickly with you. God loves, first two. God loves us and he wants us to be in a relationship with him. We see that in verses 5 and 6 where he says, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself. Throughout the Bible we see God at work to make a family, to make a people for himself from the nation of Israel and from all nations so that he is bringing the world together united in Christ. The problem is, is that we sin. Second two words. We sinned and took ourselves away from God. Romans 5.12 tells us, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man, that would be Adam, when Adam sinned, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Though God desires to have a relationship with us, we sinned and we took ourselves away from him. That needed a solution and so the next two words, Jesus died. Jesus died upon the cross to save us. Romans 5, 8, and 9 tells us about why this happened. But God shows his love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. God loves us and wants us to be with him. We sinned and took ourselves away. Jesus came and died on the cross to save us. And it leads to the next two words, which is God forgives. God forgives us by the price that Jesus paid. In verse 19 of chapter 5 of Romans, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Because of what Jesus did, God is able to forgive your sin, able to forgive my many sins because of what Jesus has done. And what is our response, our proper response, those last two words, we accept. We accept forgiveness by the grace of God. In verse 13 of our passage today, in him you also, when you heard the truth, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That our call is to accept, to believe in Jesus. There's the gospel in ten words. God loves, we sinned, Jesus died, God forgives, 
we accept. You can easily walk someone through those truths. Maybe those truths are new to you this morning. Those truths are very securely written, foundational to our understanding of who God is, who we are, and our response. We encourage you today, do not leave this place without accepting what Christ has done for you. So our past is addressed. What we used to be is addressed in these verses. And we see the God's rescue of lost sinners in love. Before the foundation of the world, he chose a people for himself. He predestined us for adoption to himself and his family. And he sent Jesus who shed his blood for us. But the gospel also addresses our present, our present time. Our present is addressed throughout the Bible, and specifically in these verses that we have been looking at, we see we have right now what we need daily to live for Christ. We have the redemption in his blood. We have forgiveness of his sins right now. We have God's love and his grace lavished on us. We have a purpose and a mission. We are united together with others from all creation. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and we have obtained an inheritance. A little bit more on that later. One thing to note here, we have these. These are already ours. Maybe not fully fleshed out, maybe not as evident to us as we are going to see one day in eternity, but we have possession of them now. And again, the purpose of that is to praise God's glory. And the gospel also addresses our future. The gospel of Jesus addresses our future. Verse 14, you're sealed with the whole promise of the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The work of Jesus not only removed our sin from us, but it secures our future. Our hope is not just for this life, but beyond. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if, anyone, if, it, if in Christ we ho have hope, Excuse me, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Peter tells us about the goal of the gospel, which is to bring us to God in 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us, that he might bring us to God. Again, our future, to be with God. And in coming to God, we need to be with him Forever, and this is the delight of all of those who put their trust in Him. Psalm 1611, one of my favorite passages. You made known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God delights to be with His people. At the consummation of all things, as John is seeing the vision of the new Jerusalem coming down, and the description, he says, I hear the I heard the voice. Of, from a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Not only do we get to be with him, but the benefits of being united in him, in Christ, come to us in the form of an inheritance. And so believers should stand confident in their future because the gospel addresses their past and present and their future. And that inheritance that we have, our inheritance is sealed and delivered. Because of Jesus' work for us, we are given an inheritance. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Your inheritance is secure, it is prepared for you. You have obtained it in Christ. When we're adopted by God to himself, we are predestined to inheritance. Again, we talked about this a couple times ago when we talked about the difference between our modern idea of adoption and the Roman idea of adoption. That adoption was not about building a family, but rather securing an heir. It was a decision made by the patriarch of the family. Who is my household? Who is my belongings going to go to? And if there wasn't a son who was worthy to pass that along, then the patriarch would choose someone outside of his immediate family. 
and they would become an heir. He would adopt them and everything that had been theirs was gone and they would come and receive the inheritance that the patriarch was giving. It was irrevocable and permanent. It was a covenant and a binding agreement. And our inheritance is very similarly described. Our inheritance provides an heir, Christ and us as fellow heirs. As we heard in the passage this morning, Romans 8, 16 and 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and as children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. It is, a, it is a covenant, a binding agreement, irrevocable and permanent. We see that in verse 13 and 14, a guarantee until we acquire possession of it. In Hebrews 9, 15, therefore Christ is a mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance, eternal inheritance. In 2 Corinthians 5, 5, he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And I think I dropped the page. Now we're back in order. Awesome. You'll hear that verse again and again. So what is our inheritance? We keep talking about inheritance. We go, okay, inheritance. I know kind of what an inheritance is. Right? When somebody dies, that gets passed on. Well, what is our inheritance in Christ? Our inheritance in Christ has many parts, and it is a sum total of all the things that God has promised us in salvation. And amongst those things are God himself. God himself. The Old Testament has many references to the Lord being the, the portion of Israel, the inheritance of his people. We are given eternal life. The giver of life invites us to join him in his life. And as God is eternal, our spiritual life will be eternal with him. And in order for that to happen, we get new bodies. Amen. Amen. New bodies. <laughs> new bodies that will be able to endure eternity. New bodies that will be able to stand uncorrupted and uninterrupted in the presence of God. New bodies that will not wear out or be lessened by disease, sickness, disability. Part of our inheritance is our glorification. As the sons and daughters of God are revealed to be God's children and glorified. Receive the kingdom of God. Jesus says he's describing the final judgment. Where he's separating the sheep and the goats. Those who belong to the king and those who don't. In Matthew 25, 34, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We will have all that we ever need according to the riches of God's grace. So how do we know? How do we know that we will receive our inheritance? We know because God has promised it. He has, as verse 11 says, predestined us for that inheritance. He has prophesied about it throughout the entire Hebrew scripture. He has procured it in Christ. He has prepared us for it. He has prepared us for the same thing as God. He has proclaimed it through the eyewitness of those who walked with Jesus and through the word and through the testimony of people throughout the generations who made disciples, who made disciples, who made disciples. We know that we have it because he protects it for us. As we saw in 1 Peter Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Amen. Um, 
Why do we know that our inheritance is secure? Because God's will and his work has been to the praise of his glory, and he has secured our inheritance for us. God has sealed his people with the seal of the Holy Spirit. So the seal is talked about is like a signet ring. Signet ring was used to represent the authority of the government or the authenticity, the possessions of a certain household. They would melt some wax, press the signet ring in with the emblem of that household or that authority. And that would be the authentication on documents, on cargo. Perhaps you remember the story of Jesus being placed in the tomb. And the guard was sent and they sealed the tomb, putting the authority behind it. Do not open this tomb, but also the authenticity. This is the tomb that Jesus is lying in. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. God presses his signet ring into our lives like indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is our down payment also, the guarantee of the inheritance. The word there used refers to earnest, earnest money. If you've ever bought a house and you've paid earnest money, you give them a small amount, maybe 500 or $1,000 to say, I am going to buy your house. I'm going to continue on this process. The rest is coming later, but I'm serious about this. And this text is telling us that the Holy Spirit is God's earnest money, saying, I am going to give you an inheritance that is beyond anything anyone could have on earth. And, and just to let you know that I'm going to keep my word, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, who will guide you and direct you and help you walk in those paths. He is the guarantee of our inheritance. And therefore, believers should stand confident in their future. If we have confidence in our future, then how do we live? How do you live if you get a $50 billion inheritance? Or maybe that you know that you are going to get it that is secure. You've even seen the money available. How do you live in light of an inheritance that is to come? Well, believers in Christ have nothing to lose in living for Christ. Their inheritance is secure. And our inheritance is sealed and delivered. We already have it. No one can take us, take it away from us. And therefore, we can live boldly for Christ. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 give us these ways to, this way for us to live. Whatever you do, what does that include? Everything. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Dave wore a shirt yesterday that said, uh, and I, I, I was going to take a picture of it, but I didn't get there in time. It says, work for God. The retirement plan is out of this world. <laughs> You're working for the Lord because your inheritance is coming. It's secure. It's all yours. So serve Christ. What does that look like? It looks like living boldly. To live boldly is to walk like Jesus did. We be gracious with our words and our actions, and we be truthful like Him, speaking courageously about the gospel. That we live by God's standards, even when those around us are not living by them. And that we take risks for the gospel's sake, whether it's near or far away. Maybe you pile in a van and drive to Kentucky. Maybe you invite your neighbors who are living around you. To come and study the Bible together. To come and join us on a Sunday morning. Maybe you go and you serve the homeless or addicts or people in prison or people you know that are just hurting. You pour yourself out for Jesus. And you can endure suffering and trials because of what they bring. What do they bring? 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Our inheritance is secure. We can live boldly for Jesus. We can take a step out, and that may be a small step for some, and maybe a large step. Maybe God has been laying something on your heart for years, 
And you kept saying, no, I'll wait. I'm not sure if I'm in the right place. I got a lot going on. Your inheritance is secure. So whatever you do, work at it with all your heart is working for the Lord and not for men because that inheritance is yours. And when we know that our future is secure, we can start to change the world around us as we live and as we speak boldly the gospel of Jesus, as we love those who are in our homes, in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools who are hard to love. And maybe you've even heard us, what is... What is the motivation with all God has done to the praise of his glory, with our inheritance secure? We can love like Jesus. <coughs> our future is secure and we will not lose it if we are in Christ. If that's you this morning, I would challenge you prayerfully. Ask God, God, what do you want me to do with the inheritance that is coming to me, with the life that you've given me now, the freedom from sin. What you will you give? What will you do with this child that you are drawing to yourself? If that's not you, if you are not in Christ this morning, as I said before, the gospel is very clear. God loves you. He desires to have a relationship with you. And through your sin, you are now separated from God. You are not with him. But Jesus came and he died on the cross. And because of what Jesus did, God is willing to forgive, has arms open to you. Will you accept that gift of forgiveness today? And there's an inheritance waiting for you as you do. Would you stand and join me as we close in prayer? Actually, we have our song. I'm sorry. Go ahead and stand. We'll sing after. Get the word. Ah. God, thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the kindness that you have shown us in Christ, that you have secured our inheritance for us, that you have chosen a people for yourself, that you have explained to us how we are separated from you by our sin. And God, as we sing this song, The Solid Rock, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to center our lives on Christ so that we can see and we can show others around you that you deserve our praise and glory and that we can have confidence because of what Jesus has done.
as you go this week, be salt and light. Show the good news of the gospel in your life, in the way that you live, your decisions, in the words that you speak. Your inheritance is secure. Your God loves you. And that is something that can never be separated from those who are in Christ. Father, thank you for my friends. I ask that you would bless them this week. Bless those around them as they live out the praise of your glory and grace to the, to the honor of Christ's name. Thank you for sending Jesus and making us your own. Remind us this week through each other and through our time with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.